Lolita, light of my life, fire in my loins, my sin, my soul, Lolita. The tip of the tongue taking a trip of three steps down the palate to tap at three on the teeth. Lo, li, ta. She was low, plain low in the morning, standing four feet ten in one sock. She was Lola in slacks. She was Dolly at school. She was Dolores on the dotted line. But in my arms, she was always Lolita. Welcome to Band Book Club. We're your hosts, Nick. Rafaela. And Nicolas. That was a quote from, you guessed, Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov, one of the most controversial and renowned novelists of the 20th century. So we could be fancy literary critics and talk about the elegant prose of this novel and the deep cultural impact and the commentary on love, but we'd really be ignoring the elephant in the room here, which I think is what this whole book is really about, the elephant in the room, (laughs) which you guys know what I'm talking about. I think I know what you're talking about. I don't, I mean, even if you haven't read this book, you've heard of it in some way. He's a pedophile. Yes. It's a book about (laughs) a pedophile. (laughs) I mean, that's it. We We can dress it up all we want. You can make 300 pages of beautiful prose about it. It's it's a guy that's in the kids, and that's what he's trying to do in this book. And he does it successfully. But there's another thing that is love. Maybe. I'm just saying. Maybe. Maybe. Let, we're going to... We're, we're going to... More on that later. <laughs> we will unpack that. But just to get things started, um, just a little bit about Vladimir Nabokov. Um, hopefully... I'm saying that right. So he was born in 1899 in St. Petersburg, Russia, and he was part of a very aristocratic family. Um, He was a poet. He wrote plays. He wrote nine books in Russia, in Russian, um, before he really got his success when he moved to the U.S., where he finally started writing in English, and that's where Lolita uh, came about. He was trilingual, too, as a kid, which I only mention because one of the languages he knew was French. And all throughout this novel, he'll be talking about something horrible, just disgusting. And then he'll sprinkle in some French words in there. And you're like, ooh, that sounds nice. To make it more delicate. Yeah. (laughs) Like, oh, French, like beautiful. I feel like I'm reading the Restoration Hardware, uh, (laughs) you know, (laughs) catalog catalog or something. But, oh, oh, wait. Yeah, it's... uh, it's about pedophilia. That's what he's he he's still talking about. That definitely has a um, uh, he's really good with language. So this book really is beautiful. But reason why it's banned? I mean, obviously for obvious reasons, it's banned because of what it's about. But um, the kid stuff. The kid stuff. Yes. Yeah. So you might be wondering, how do you get a book like this published? So especially in the fifties. Yes, it was published in nineteen fifty five. Um, it was turned down by Viking, Simon & Schuster, New Directions, Farrar, Strauss, Doubleday. A lot of warnings about getting this published, but he ended up going to France. He met with uh, publisher Maurice Giridas of the Olympia Press. He was not too happy about the book. He wanted him to do it under a different name. Um, But after a lot of uh, uh, fighting, they went ahead, they published it, and he did it in his own name, Vladimir Nabokov. I think there were some concerns, too, that he was, that the book was a little bit autobiographical, maybe. I mean, I don't blame the guy for thinking that. I would think that, too. If uh, I mean, at a certain point, if you are writing in so much detail with such expertise about I, something. I immediately thought about that. Yeah. I know. thought that this is a sick person, that he wrote that to uh, cover up his actions. That's, yeah. that's how it came to my mind. It's like you meet a guy and he he knows how to take apart the engine of a car and put it back together. And you're like, wow, how'd you learn to do that? And he's like, oh, I, you know, for fun, you know, I just learned. I, you <laughs> not, know, not, I wanted, that I, not that I worked 20 years doing it. I saw some guy doing it one time and I just want to make fun I, of him. I so. picked it up just like that. Yeah. 
Well, this was obviously one of his most, uh, I mean, a very famous book. All his other novels really never reached this much success. This book is known as a classic, as one of the best books ever written. It's ranked number four in the list of Modern Library's 100 Best Novels. Um, But one nice little fact about Nabokov um, that I don't think a lot of authors can say this is they were, he was a very accomplished entomologist and he studied butterflies. That is cool. It also made me think of Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. Because he, wow, I never thought about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he he was in love with mm. bugs too. You know, I, I'm mm. not trying to um, besmirch Nabokov. Clearly, a way more intelligent guy than me. He did something with his life. Um, <laughs> it's just some of these things are are odd. It it is odd. He definitely must be an odd man, or must have been an odd man. To to his credit, he did have a uh, a normal marriage and. A, a normal functioning family, right? Yeah, right, and, and he was and, a perfectionist. F- yeah, he was a perfectionist, and the family always talked about him with the best words. Right. He was a very lovable person. I mean, you can see from interviews that he he gave throughout the years. He was very sweet. Yeah, he's not the typical withdrawn, moody author in the interviews. He seems like a nice guy. Something about the butterflies that you said earlier, uh, I would like to mention that 20, he he caught more than 4,000 in his life, but 20 of them, they were new species. Uh, and he gave the names um, from characters of his books, which I think is pretty interesting. That's pretty cool. I wonder what the Lolita butterfly was. Is there a Lolita butterfly? I mean... There must be if he named it, it after his characters. Be. Yeah. He gave 20 names from characters, so it has to be there. Well, speaking of characters, we have pretty much four main characters. So obviously we have Humbert Humbert, who is your um, narrator. He is uh, the guy that's the pedophile. Um, he's very proper. The pedophile guy. The pedophile guy. He's... Um, He's a translator of French poetry at the university level. Mm-hmm. So he's extremely sophisticated and good with words. And that's kind of how Nabokov gets away with a lot of these overblown sentences you see from the beginning. Right. And his fascination is with nymphettes, which according to Humbert, Humbert, it is a girl who is aged 9 to 14, prepubescent. Um, there's a specific type of girl that's a nymphette. It's not just anybody 9 to 14. They have a certain quality about them. They are a little bit more mature. They might be a little more playful. Um, but, yeah. It's... He likes his steaks uh, medium, like in between. <laughs> No, that's that's really yeah. it's important because that's what this guy's whole deal is, is he likes things that are not quite one thing or the other, kind of in the right in the middle of being okay or not okay. I mean certainly it's not okay because it's a kid, but he likes not super young kids, like he's not into four year olds. He likes kids that are right on the cusp. He has some standards, that's what you're telling us. <laughs> A wrong, wrong standards, but he had some yeah, standards. Yeah, yeah. It, he, it only works for him if it's right in between kid and adult, right. that, that prepubescent, the nymphette. There, in, there's an excerpt from the book that explains yeah. it probably better than we can. Here. He'll tell you himself. <laughs> oh, he will. He's very, <laughs> it's amazing how yes. upfront Humbert is in this yeah. book. Uh-huh. I wish to introduce the following idea. Between the age limits of 9 and 14, there occur maidens who, to certain bewitched travelers, twice or many times older than they, reveal their true nature, which is not human but nymphic, that is, demoniac. And these chosen creatures I propose to designate as nymphets. So they're almost like little demons, too, to, to Humbert. He, he likes the idea of it being wrong. I think, and maybe we can talk more about that later, but... Well, the nymphette that he's in love with is obviously Lolita. Yeah, good segue. <laughs> Lolita is 12 years old at the time um, when when they come together. 
Uh, she is vulgar and loud and just a true American gal, um, but she seems to be a little bit um, more mature for her age. She definitely knows things. Um, she's not so innocent, but she's still innocent enough to act like a, a child. Yeah, she tends to keep poking yeah, Humbert over and over. Right. Yeah. Which, you know, it's normal for kids and to an extent. Right. No, no, no. If they can tell they're getting a reaction out of you. Let me be clear. She wasn't poking him that way. <laughs> she, she was poking him playfully kid, with a kid's way. But it was enough for him to take it a little bit further than... Yeah. Like the like that weird uncle that everybody yeah. knows. Yeah. Then you but, have uh, you have Charlotte who is the wife um or not wife. She is the she's mom. She's Lolita's mom. She's Lolita's yeah. mom. And she's she also how they come together we might as well mention is uh Charlotte rents a room to Humbert who is fleeing Europe because he went to an insane asylum because he's a pedophile. Right. Right. And Charlotte is not refined. Um, she's but she everything. Wants to be. She wants to be. Unlike Lolita, who's going to stay in her way, Charlotte really likes the idea of having Humbert around. It makes her feel more proper. Um, but she is a pretty depressing character. Yeah, her husband died. We should mention that. Yeah, she's so, a widow. So when, when she saw Humbert, everything she's started, yeah, she started thirsty waking up. for yeah. Humbert. <laughs> um, oh, Englishman. Mm-hmm. Fancy. Oh, a fine yes. man. And, and then, w- one more thing about Charlotte that's interesting to know is she foreshadows what Humbert ends up becoming later in the book with his dynamic with Lolita, as in the simping one, the the desperate one in the relationship that's that's needy. Yeah, and they're more connected than we see in the beginning. Yeah, they they're gonna become actually pretty connected. But they are connected between them. He even mentions later, I think, um, Charlotte, I underst- I did not know you then, or I understand you now. So, yeah. But in the beginning, he's very annoyed with her, and mm-hmm. she couldn't be lamer in his eyes. Lastly, we have Quilty, who is a playwright. His name is Claire Quil- Quilty. A lot of people look up to this guy. Lolita's in love with him. Um, he's a very accomplished playwright. And uh, he is also a pedophile, but he's really the... the a different um, kind of pedophile. A different kind of pedophile. He's, no, he's a pedophile. He's... Uh, <laughs> if we were to make... He's not as romantic. If you made an, as, like an Excel sheet ranking how bad different kind of pedophiles were, um, Humbert might be like an 8 or a 9, and Quilty would be a 10. Right, right. And I you know, perfect way to right at the end him. of the book, Nabokov shows you that... And Humbert looks kind of not good, but a little bit better as a person for a second for um, giving justice to Quilty. Right. Yeah. Well, just to kind of run through a quick plot. um, And of course, if you haven't read this book here on out, we got spoilers for you. So Humbert moves to America he is renting a room in the Hayes house uh, with Charlotte, and he meets Lolita, and he obviously is obsessed with Lolita. She's the ultimate nymphette. Um, Total nymph. And she, <laughs> they get married so that he can stay with uh, Lolita and be part of the house. So he also becomes a father to, um, to Lolita. Perfectly sane. Perfectly sane. Very logical sense. idea. Yeah. And so he keeps a diary of um, him explaining his love for Lolita and and all his. Deep he also calls secrets. Charlotte a dumb cow in there. He yes, he's not very nice to Charlotte. Um, I mean, everything is written down. Everything yes. that happens, Every everything little he thought, has in mind. Even yeah. his thoughts oh, of murdering Charlotte. Are you know what there. I just remembered? When he starts that diary, he he says, "I know all this stuff is terrible." But it's okay because no one will ever understand the writing because I'm. It's so microscopic, and um, I think he says the word uh, like satanic or something. He said only a loving wife would be able to decipher these words. Oh my gosh! And of course, later he gets a loving wife. It's Charlotte, and she deciphers the words. 
She does. She discovers this diary. When she does, she runs out hysterically out of the home and she gets uh, plowed over by a car. So Charlotte's out of the picture. And she doesn't live. And yes. her head explodes. Yeah. I just want to throw that out. <laughs> yes. That detail is in there. Um, while this, while, when this happened, Lolita was away at a camp, um, which the camp had a nice, beautiful lake in it called Camp or Lake Climax. So um, that's mm. really on the nose. Uh, so when they when Humbert goes to pick Lolita up from this camp, he doesn't mention anything about Charlotte being dead. So they come together. They go to a hotel called the Enchanted Hunters. They have sex. Um, and only then does Humbert say <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Charlotte. So... Lolita moves on. They still are together. She there's a push and pull in this relationship. Um, it's also at the hunter's lodge. It's the only time that Lolita will initiate sex with Humbert in the book. That is correct. Unless I missed it somewhere. Yeah, earlier in the book, it was more just uh, this fascination with Humbert, but they don't actually. She gives him a few anything. pecks. Um, they do kiss when he picks her up. So she hugs they, him. And then the the Hunter's Lodge, um, she wants to show off. She says what she learned at camp and how adult she is. But after that, it's just just Humbert. It's a one way street. Yes. So and she started it. She she does and, engage. And she yeah. engages it. So they travel around America. They visit pretty much every major city. And then one day she is uh, she goes to the hospital. She gets injured or gets sick and. Um, She's kidnapped by, we later find out, Claire Quilty. So Humbert doesn't see Lolita for about two years, and he's looking for her. He, he doesn't like that. He Yes, he hires an investigator to find her. Um, he only finds her when he gets a letter in the mail from Lolita, and she explains that she's pregnant, she's very poor, she and needs And also, money. can I have $4,000? Yeah, she needs some money. So um, Humbert finds her, goes to her finds out about Quilty kidnapping her. He's still very much in love with Lolita. She doesn't want to be with him. He leaves. He kills Quilty. And then he's arrested for the murder of Quilty. Um, and then he writes his confession while he's in jail. And this is what prison. we did. This is the book, basically. His confession. What a dummy to write this as your confession. <laughs> yeah. Like, did, it, did you really think this was going to help you? Well, there was a reason behind it. He said that, first of all, he didn't want it to be as a confession. Uh, it was more like a love confession, let's say, for Lolita and him. But throughout the book, he said a few times that he may use he may use some of the stuff that happened, probably the ones that he tried to excuse himself. Um, so maybe he can have a lower, uh, a, you know, a softer fall. Well, you do get the sense that he's trying to um, pad the fall here because he is he does directly yeah. say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury or people listening to me, this is how it was and I'm I'm innocent. But in the world of this book, I think Humber wrote this because he's just a narcissist. Right. And you can see that throughout the book because he mentions over and over, he interrupts over and over what he's saying just to mention how beautiful he is. He does, yeah. And how he can have anybody that he wants. In the middle of a sentence, he'll tell you. <laughs> and um, he also speaks in the third person. And I don't know if you've ever met someone in real life that speaks in the third person. I have. And it, it's a bizarre. It's, it's creepy. It's very creepy. Yeah, when they're somebody, never. Yeah. It, these aren't people that like everything else is normal about them, except that one thing. There, there's a um, something going on there. At least full of things. Yeah, and you know the narcissism of Humbert is, I think, important because it it starts to make you think about what his motives for all this other stuff, like. Did he really love Lolita or was this just like a big, I don't know, some sort of weird personal thing for himself that he was doing? That was one of the questions that kept popping up to me in the book. I don't know if it has an answer. Well, but. one thing that kind of adds to Humbert's character is when he was younger, he had a love um, 
Annabelle. Annabelle Lee. And she was tragically killed. And I think he just... They did have a beautiful connection. Yeah. And he was in love with It her. was his first love. I mean, yeah. who? everybody has their first love. And you can never forget them, even if you break up or move on or they get killed in this instance. Um, but I think he just spent his life trying to fill that void. But I think he found Lolita and didn't realize how deeply he would fall in love with her. Mm-hmm. But... But just in general, this book breaks a lot of rules. Well, not just with the subject, uh, but just the way it's written, re- talking in the third person, explaining things to the reader. like A lot more telling than showing. Right. Before like, anything happens, he'll explain, like he'll give you a, a preface to what's about to happen so that you can empathize with him and he'll even feel tell sorry you, for him. Hey, reader, something weird is going to happen in a couple pages and you should think this way about it. <laughs> like, right. It's kind of ballsy, actually. I've never read a um, book like that that breaks the fourth wall. But he pulls it off, Nabokov does, because um, you already believe in this guy who's so weird and eccentric that it seems normal to him. And that's kind of what this book does is um, insane things will happen and you'll read on and think that it's normal because you kind of come under this spell. Right. The spell of the writer. Yes. The, of the narrator, of the words, the way they sound. Um, probably like how a little kid would be seduced by an adult. But um, for the reader... I think that happens by virtue of the prose and how he does the writing in here. Yeah, we should talk about the writing. It's um, it's the most, I guess, poetic and flowery and beautiful um, book you will ever read. If you want to be cynical, you could call it purple prose. Yeah. So it's it's really beautiful and it's it has a, a beautiful rhythm into it which immediately magnetizes you from the first page. And uh, I don't know, the, it makes you feel things that you wouldn't feel otherwise. Right. I don't think a book uh, like this could be written by someone like Hemingway or Bukowski. It just it would never no, work. No. It's funny you bring up Hemingway because the thing he was so proud of was you know, have you ever heard of the iceberg theory of his? Um, yes, I think so. But you can or go into like, more detail. You know, to explain his sentences that were so short and stark, he would say, well, the energy of my sentences are not in the sentences. It's They're just the tip of the iceberg. And the energy that's going on is the actual iceberg underneath mm-hmm. where everything is implied. This is like... The iceberg is tipped upside down and the, right. the bottom is floating on top and you see everything. Yeah. No, everything is definitely laid out there, but the way it's written and because of what it's about, I think this kind of language just made you, well, for me, it made me want to read it and it almost made me want to hear Humbert just to listen to him talk and and it made me almost empathize with him. And I had to keep reminding myself, oh, God, he's a pedophile. No, no. You got seduced. I I, I think so. I think I came under his spell. He and seemed very romantic. And that's he was, really gross to say. He was doing that by never using a bad word, uh, something, you know, um, dirty words. He never used There's like the, four curse words. Yeah, it's yeah. not an explicit he never book described in any, terms of language. He never described any sex scenes or anything dirty with Lolita in general. You knew what was happening. He mm-hmm. told you what was happening. But if you didn't pay attention, you may have missed it. Yes. Here's my theory for why that's dirtier than if you read something like, say, Bukowski, where he would just say, I took the blank and she took her blank and we did blank and it was all blank on the blank (laughs) um there's none of that in here like you said it's um i would say innuendos and metaphors but but why it's dirtier is your brain is the one making those connections he never comes out and says it like you know you'll know what's going on um he's doing this or that with lolita 
and you'll know exactly what's going on, but it never says it all the way. So he makes you participate in the dirtiness. The horrible accent of his. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with Bukowski, you would never have to. It would just be, okay, this happened, I'm done. And He's like, a straightforward man. There's no other way to interpret this. <laughs> yeah. But this, like, you had to think about it a little bit yourself. So you're, you, he forces you to play along. But, you know, I, I said the pros might be a little purple, if you want to look at it that way. But to be fair, it is a mastery of rhythm, this pros. And I don't know if you want to do this, but if you just drum out the words with your finger, the rhythm, you will hear mm -hmm. what's going on. Even if you ignore the meaning of all the words, if you took the first page. Yeah, you could totally read the book and uh, tap your foot into the rhythm of the book. It was. It just sounds like music. Yeah, like, Lolita, light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul. And then it goes on and on and... Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I it's like a that. bit of a song. It's um, I think it's unique. And uh, like you said before, you mentioned perfume. It had something similar going on there, but not in this uh, kind of quality. You didn't think so? No. Because I remember that was I, your favorite book when we read it. I don't want to say that it is my favorite book. Lolita is going to be from now on my favorite book because if I do, uh, people are going to freak out with me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do uh, love it. One thing I put it up there. about perfume that I think also this book had was the way things were described. It was never just, you know, like she wore a pink dress or her face looked like this or she was eating that. It described every little detail. And I felt like perfume did that with the smells. Um, it you was, were smelling things with this. You're really seeing and feeling everything. The sensory quality was so strong. I don't know if that means it was sensual. It was sensual. It, it was a sensual Like in a sexual book. way, sensual, but sensual as in just your senses too. Like you felt the fabric, you smelled the smells. Mm -hmm. You, um, man, I can't reference a lot of the stuff in here without sounding like a freak. But um, <laughs> yeah. um, like he, the one I keep thinking about is Lolita was in the pool and she got out and Humbert said you could see the quicksilver vibrating in the folds of her baby fat. Like he so her stomach was wet. <laughs> yeah, right. <You> <laughs> but, just said that. But no, but, I mean, that's how that's how Humbert talks. Yeah, and, and depending on what kind of reader you are, you'll either think that that's junk or you'll think it's beautiful. But I think we all agreed that it was beautiful. beautiful. And, and disgusting. And Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this book, I think you need to read a um, few pages and read it in the beginning just to get the idea of how this book will work from now on and how it wanted to be read. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, you, how the book teaches you to, to read it. Yeah. Yeah. It took yeah, me a while. It took me a while to, first of all, it's pretty difficult, especially for me, it was very difficult to, to read. It wasn't a simple book. It wasn't a Bukowski book. Uh, but not only that, I had to learn how to read it because of the rhythm. So, right. so it was quite the work for me. Well, I mean, that can happen with any book, but if it's a good book, the rhythm will have a, you know, an overall pattern and you'll learn that pattern and you go in and out and there's some times where it got flat even, but it worked. I have, I have a moment like that. Uh, there was the moment that uh, Lolita disappeared. Uh, Qu what's his name? Uh, Quilty. Yeah, Quilty, Quilty yeah. kidnaps her. Quilty kidnapped Lolita and that moment forward, from that moment forward, uh, the whole book fell flat. Mm -hmm. The feeling that I got, it was just uh, not there anymore. So I went from dancing in the flowers <laughs> to uh, walking uh, in the straight pavement. It was just nothing there. And I couldn't figure out why someone the at his level, Lolita. yeah, why had someone at his level left the book go flat like that. And then that came back when he found Lolita. And that's when it kicked in my mind, and I was like, that's why. Well, that's 
I think they teach this in like if you go to intro to art class, if you're learning about art as in paintings, but one of the qualities is called unity, and that's when the form of what you did matches the content that you're trying to show. And this book is a masterful example of that. Um, because of this reason, it became one of my favorite books. Because of the unity. it tricked me all the way through. And I didn't, I didn't understand why. And it, just, it was just the feeling. I didn't have to think about it. It was just the feeling that the writer gave me. And I think that was very powerful. It was indeed. And just one last thing on the prose. I've never read a book where the lines sounded as similar to music as this book. You hear the lines in here, and not just the first page, but other ones, and the way they're arranged, it sounds like they existed forever already, like a song when you hear it the first time, and you just discovered it. I don't know how you do that. <laughs> no, he was he was amazing. And I should mention that the guy was writing on all his books pretty much. He was writing them on uh, index cards. And Jeez. he liked to uh, take, um, the, there are some photos too. Um, you can see that he took an index card and he described the gun that he sat quilty with and how this gun he wanted to look like and what characteristics this gun had. So he was taking all these index cards and he was putting them at the end together, which I think. So in other words, Nabokov had a ton of free time. He was a psycho <laughs> and yeah, he had a lot of free time. Yeah. But, but that's what we love him for. Yeah. He was also um, someone with synesthesia, which I have never met somebody that has that. So he could- Which well, it uh, definitely shows. It shows in this in this book for sure. I I don't think you could write like this if you didn't have this problem. And for anyone who doesn't know, synesthesia is a disorder where your senses overlap and you smell sounds and you hear colors and blah blah blah, which sounds like you know something your made up. your weird <laughs> aunt from California would say to you. Yeah. But if you read this book you would think, okay, yeah, this guy probably had something like that. Right. Because the images and the comparisons just are off the wall sometimes. They're beautiful, but sometimes they were so abstract that I didn't even know what was going on. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. I won't act like I'm super smart and I know. <laughs> like when they were in the lodge, do you remember? Um, there was a whole page and a half where I, I didn't realize until a page later where he spent one sentence on it and he confirmed it, that they were uh, having sex for a page and a half because the whole time he was describing like, I saw a hunter running through the woods and a fawn. That's and, what he did throughout the whole yeah, book. And a bubble <laughs> like, okay, this is a cool little story. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, you, you're thinking about it. You're like, is that what I'm, is this what he's trying yeah. to do here? You and then and he reread. throws it out there and we're like, whoa, that's what he was talking about? Yeah, okay. I mean, so either he was extremely pretentious or this is actually how he saw life, in which case he was probably exhausted. Like, just eating a hard-boiled egg for this guy must have been like, <laughs> oh, like... <laughs> Quite the adventure. Yeah. Before we continue, just a quick interruption. Are you enjoying this episode? If you are, go ahead and like and subscribe. If you have anything to add to the discussion go ahead and comment down below. Now back to the episode. So there were a lot of notable scenes in this book that we would love to uh, read directly from the novel. You mean traumatizing, hard to forget, scarring scenes? Yes. Um, well, scenes, by the way, that they didn't even include in the movie, which we watched. Th that that yeah. hardcore. Yeah. And it was Stanley Kubrick, you know. Yeah, the I mean, <laughs> not to get into that right now, but the movie was a little underwhelming for me. It was okay. It was a good movie. I don't know what else they could have done. I don't know what they could have showed. I don't know what I was expecting, but This is stuff you couldn't really show in a I movie. don't know. I don't know what to think about the movie. Typical movie. To be honest. It was Because an, I slept through it. <laughs> <laughs> it was an okay movie. I do want to see the one with Jeremy Irons, just because it's Jeremy Irons. Um, I'm curious how that one 
was different. It's just him saying, oh, Lolita, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Let's um, talk about the scenes that the movie was too afraid to do. Yes. Um, I think one of... When when we you first start reading this book and everything's, you know, you know where it's going, I personally was not expecting this scene to happen. So No one was expecting that scene. You're talking, of course, about... The, the apple. apple scene. The, the famous apple scene. Apple scene. <laughs> yes, you guys so. told me about this before I got to it, and I was racking my brain to figure <laughs> Waiting out for what he apple. did with was apple. telling me about it I before, was and I didn't know, and I was I, like, I need to hear that. I was trying to figure out, okay, so what sort of sick thing can you do with an apple? I thought, like, <laughs> did he throw it at her head? Did he, like, st- stick the apple somewhere it wasn't well, supposed to go? We call it an apple, the, the, scene, the apple scene, uh, because there is an apple in the beginning of the scene. It has nothing to do later on. Yes. Yeah, so. so Lolita is eating an apple and she's sitting on the couch with Humbert Humbert and she lays her legs across him and she's just giggling and laughing and eating this apple. But the motion of her legs rubbing up on Humbert. Creates a certain friction yes. that is to satisfaction, media, yeah. satisfactory <laughs> to our protagonist. Yeah, I'm trying to talk like Nabokov and I can't. No. <laughs> yeah. And anyways, he ends up uh well being so aroused that Hold he, on. he was he was very uh, sneaky with the whole scene. And yes, I couldn't he was, like, figure coughing. out coughing, he was singing cuz she was singing a song, so he was singing so along with So he was her. singing and he was moving. He's singing the Carmen Carmen Barman song. Yeah. Uh, so because he realizes when he does that it makes Lolita laugh and when Lolita laughs she moves back and forth and he was moving with the song. And, and you can put two and two together what he ends up doing um, in, in his pants. The and bubble so, of paradise is what he calls it. Well, he also calls it the poison bubble in his pants. Yes, there's lots of bubbles <laughs> rising and <laughs> bursting. Also, and he was he was describing in a moment that he was sitting always kind of um, a certain way to hide, hide that yeah. bubble. Oh, yeah, with the, his uh, trusty robe. Yeah, yeah. He, he it feels very accomplished that she didn't notice, and he feels like nothing that bad happened. Um, and he lets you know, hey, it was a victimless crime. So Yeah, he, he goes through the whole scene. He describes how ho- this horrible act to a 12-year-old and eight months old, whatever she was. And then instead of saying, you know, yeah, it was horrible, but you know something, I did it, whatever. At least have the guys say He comes out and he says this, and I would like you to read that. I felt proud of myself. I had stolen the honey of a spasm without impairing the morals of a minor. Absolutely no harm done. The conjurer had poured milk, molasses, foaming champagne into a young lady's new white purse, and lo, the purse was intact. Thus I had delicately constructed my ignoble, ardent, sinful dream, and still Lolita was safe, and I was safe. So in... (laughs) How horrible! In in this, in oh, this, no. he's he's actually <laughs> he's excusing himself, and not only he's excusing himself, he's telling us that this kid was never harmed. So, yeah, like oh, there is well, no in, problem. In that case, yes, he yeah, didn't steal means. her innocence. She by, didn't understand by the... what happened. So, therefore, at this she's case, okay. yeah, yeah, and he's proud a lot of it. Of, right. There's a lot of scenes. Well, in it, here he like does that. show you. I know people are going to hate what I'm going to say, but he shows like he cared for her, not to harm her, even though he did later on. But but he, he gives you like, oh, you know, I, I actually didn't want to harm her. So I'm glad nothing showed up. Nothing. See, he, he never understood anything. So it's yeah. fine. No right? harm, no foul. Right. You know what was more shocking to me, actually, than this scene was something that came a little bit before it, right when he starts living in the house. And it's when Lolita is alone at home with Humbert, and she has a speck caught in her eye. Oh, okay. And um, Humbert hears her whining, and he saunters up to the bathroom upstairs, and he's like, what's wrong, Lo? And she says, I have a speck in my eye. And he's like, kind of joking, you know, if I was a slave in Sweden, uh, and you were the, the king or the queen, I would be forced to... Uh, lick your eyeball until it was the speck came out and she's like oh haha you're so funny and um, he licks her eye 
Yeah. He licks her eyeball and gets the speck out. Did he lick the other eyeball too, Lady? I don't know if he goes in for both eyeballs. Actually, Seconds. no, no. I remember. <laughs> I remember. It said he pursed his lips and was bringing it to her other eye, and I think she shoes him away or something. Maybe getting some sort of sense of how freakish and uh, nightmarish what he's doing is, but. Something about the intimacy of that and the, I don't know, the something with the eyes uh, was very disturbing. That That is disturbing. Basically, if you haven't read it and you're still here, horrible mistake, you should have read it and then come here. But it's the whole book is exactly like this. Scenes like this that they're not so bad, but the feeling that you get from them is like, Wow, and it really throws you off. I, I yeah, and then a scene like this pops up, <laughs> and the boundary keeps getting pushed after that more and more. Right, and it slowly is just normal to you. Right, I I think the whole thing was intentional from him to go that way, so slowly. What one thing that's interesting though is after Charlotte dies and Humbert is just kind of going hog wild with Lolita when it's the two of them he seems to become less happy in a way even though he's getting more of what he's interested in yeah he becomes a lot more manipulative not just with the language and you know wooing her in a way is he starts to just straight up buy her things pay for her to have sex with him and they both didn't seem very happy She cried almost every night when he wasn't around, but not in front of him. And he's spending a ton of money, which, you know, qualifier. There are some things about the relationship in this book that are relatable to anyone who's been in love before. Yeah, definitely. The he does sacrifice a lot for Lolita. Um Financially, it, it is wrong the way it sounds. It, yeah, yeah. There's no way to make it sound but, good. But but you have eventually uh, you have to stop thinking about the pedophilia and the kid, and you have to concentrate in the love of the story, which uh, that's what he wanted to do from the beginning. Yeah, that's what I think, and and you can say from the beginning of the book, it starts with being very warm and so and talks about love and this unhappiness builds and builds as they're driving across America and you'll think Lolita is doing okay for a little bit or maybe even flirting with Humbert a tiny bit and then she'll just have a huge tantrum or she'll be sobbing at night when she's going to bed and I know this is terrible too but at one point I thought man I feel uh, just a little bit bad for Humbert you know he still deserves to go to jail and everything yeah but you know like this isn't working out how he planned you felt bad as a person that has been in a relationship and and you understand what it is to give everything for someone yes and just from his prose too you get the sense that he's deeply sad but he does there is a paragraph I'd like to go over where he talks about his sadness and his happiness and what's really going on. That's on page 166. He describes this state as something he calls beyond happiness. He's He tells you, you know, I know this sounds bad, but don't feel too sorry for me. Oh, do not scowl at me, reader. I do not intend to convey the impression that I did not manage to be happy. Reader must understand that in the possession and thraldom of an infet, the enchanted traveler stands, as it were, beyond happiness. For there is no other bliss on earth comparable to that of fondling an infet. It is or concur, that bliss, it belongs to another class, another plane of sensitivity. Despite her tiffs, despite her class, another plane... Uh, despite her nastiness, despite all the fuss and faces she made and the vulgarity and the danger and the horrible hopelessness of it all, I still dwell deep in my elected paradise, a paradise whose skies were the color of hell flames, but still a paradise. So he's, I guess when you're a nymphette guy, you don't even feel happiness anymore. 
you're in this zone where happiness and suffering are kind of the same thing and it's so oh, the passion and I guess that's what he's trying to say but even in that I, I thought there was something a little bit relatable if you've been in a deep relationship you know because you do suffer at some point in general it's a pain yeah <laughs> Let's be real. But you're kind it of happy be. at the same time. You too. are. You are, yes. And and that's I think that's what he was going through. He was going through all that. He was going through the pain and he was going through the, the satisfaction of being with her because he loved her so much. Right. And you're almost tempted to think at certain points, you know, maybe this is um, some weirdo form of love. Until you read other things like um his plan to get with another girl that's young after Lolita leaves her nymphet stage which it's a very practical plan he his idea is just to have a baby with Lolita who will one day be a nymphet and then when that one gets too old to have a baby with that one <laughs> and this is all perfectly like he just works that out in a few sentences he's like okay it's it's good so there's always this push and pull of you know, this is sick. Oh, this is kind of sweet. This is true love. No, this is just abuse and um, masochism. And that that was one of the really exciting things about this book is you never knew. But as horrible as that sounds, he still loves Lolita. At least he claims to. Yeah, it really. At the end, yeah, even really after she's me. she's aged past the nymphet zone. When when he does find her, you know, she's obviously past nymphet age, even though she's still pretty young. She must be like fifteen or sixteen. She's pregnant. She's married. Um, she's wearing her uh, pink uh, glasses. But still, so long she, after Humbert would have been attracted yeah, to anyone. Yeah, and he normally. mentions that that he would not want to pursue her after that stage. Um, but but then he says possessed. he says something on page two seventy seven, uh, where he f- when he finds her later all old and you know ready for <laughs> yeah <old>. retirement home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this this really surprised me. And it was me. almost sweet, I thought. I looked and looked at her, and I knew as clearly as I know I am to die that I loved her more than anything I had ever seen or imagined on earth, or hoped for anywhere else. She was only the faint violet whiff and dead leaf echo of the nymphette I had rolled myself upon with such cries in the past, an echo on the brink of a russet ravine with a far wood under a white sky and brown leaves choking the brook and one last cricket in the crisp weeds. But thank God it was not that echo alone that I worshipped. No, he he It is sweet. Yeah. It's sweet. um, Again, let's delete everything about a girl and everything it's, else. It's impressive but because it's, you lowered the standard so much from the beginning of yeah. the book that anything he does that's kind of okay it's is going to seem like, oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like if you have a son that's a total failure and one day he, like, makes himself lunch and takes a shower and you're he like, takes oh, so proud empty of you, glass amazing of water. son. He takes the empty glass of water and he puts it in the sink yeah. and you're like, oh, you see, that's a beautiful boy. No, but... He, <laughs> You know, kidding aside, I I never expected him to say that. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it's so his most horrible yeah. uh, personality. He, if that was true, what he was saying, then he actually transcended his obsession with nymphets for a little bit and actually cared about someone. Even when Lolita says it at the end there, that she doesn't really want anything to do with him. She just wants his money. He still gives her the money. Yeah, (laughs) he still helps her. And he moves on and avenges her. So uh, compared to everything else he did, it was pretty decent. I have to agree. If if you had to compare him to Quilty, like you were mentioning earlier, you know, Quilty was a pedophile. He would film child orgies. Um, he was just level 10 pedophile yeah he was level 10 pedophile but there was something about Humbert where he he really did care and not respected her but he 
respected the love of her. I think he 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 wanted his love was so powerful that someone harmed her. So that's why he's gonna he's go. He's gonna go that. and yeah, it's almost like a I don't think I don't think it had to do because he was shooting video of child um orgies. I don't think that was a problem with, with him. I think the problem, the main problem was because he someone harm harmed his biggest love of his yeah. life. I remember him also um being upset with the way he that Quilty practiced being a pedophile. Like it was not up to the standards of his own <laughs> Oh, wait, he's like, this is not the way you do it. Like, just embarrassing. Yeah. This is not a level 10. I need to find this uh, scaling system <laughs> to understand. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, was, that was kind of hilarious in a sick way because he seemed like a hero at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> like, right, he's like the again, knight, you the knight in him. shining armor comes in. and <laughs> I'm glad he was there to take this monster down. <laughs> yeah. I enjoyed that. I did. Um, but that brings us to maybe the biggest question of this book, which was, did Humbert really love Lolita? Yes. I say, yes. <laughs> yes. I say yes, but he, it just, if she was older, maybe things would be okay. But at the same time, at the end of the day, he was extremely manipulative I mean, he really did manipulate a lot of the love. He not forced it on her, but I think she he did steal a lot of her innocence by pursuing her and basically raping her. Yeah, like paying her as a kid. to. Yeah, well, we're as not a kid. telling you to judge him. We're just asking you: Do you think it was love? Because I you're judging think... him now too much. I know. I think this he, hero. I think we <laughs> we're like legally obligated to judge him. Aren't yeah, we? we have to. It's, we have to. Yeah, it's extremely we're wrong. Can, can, we, can we be clear that we don't like his actions? I think. Yes, clearly right. we do not. We condone any of this behavior. Perfect. Now we can move on. And, and <laughs> he loved her just like a girl. Well, I'm speaking from a girl's perspective. Like a girl is so obsessed with a boy that. You know, she just wants to kill anyone that gets near him. But when it gets to the point where you become like that jealous freak girl or you're obsessive. Yeah, you become so obsessive with the boy, then it becomes twisted and wrong. Well, that's one thing I'm I guess I'm asking is, was it love or just obsession or is there a line between the two even? I that that it, was like the narcissism be, we were talking yeah. about earlier with Humbert. Was it? I think it. You could make an argument that it was just that that it was this fantasy about him, and you know only, only him, only his desires being fulfilled. And I think you could make maybe an argument the other way, but you'll sound like a freak. <laughs> <laughs> Do I, you think he he I did think love her a little bit? Every love comes with that obsession, you know. I yeah, think right. it was a real, deep, meaningful love that he felt. And I think so because she was the only one that was able to bring him down. And he kept going. You do see him uh, just completely pitiful he sometimes could, he, from he, this little kid. He, he's done more stuff with other kids. In, in you can it describes that in the beginning of the book. But when when she came to his life, everything was changed. She brought him down to almost zero, becoming just nothing. And he still loved her. He still went after her. He still revenged her. So that's why I'm taking as love, but I tend to be pretty romantic in general. So <laughs> I guess that's why. I'm somewhat of a Well, Humbert too. was romantic too. Yeah, he was. Oh, <laughs> now, this might be an easier question to deal with. I think pretty much everyone would be in consensus on this, but Lolita probably did not know 100% what was going on here, you think? As much as she yeah. was beyond her years and... You know, a little, a little sophisticated for her age. 
Yeah, she definitely already had her innocence stolen. I mean, she admits that she had done things in this camp and... I yeah. mean, what do you expect when you send your kid to late climax? Right. But at the same time, Humbert didn't make it any better by <laughs> having sex with her. He did not make it better. No, no. he did no. not. Um, I think she acted as um, normal as any other, um, you know, 13-year-old uh, would act. You know, now she did, I think she had this attitude because of the connection, because she lost her dad. Number one, and second, yeah, no father figure can mess a girl up. I I think. Yeah, it can, and, and it doesn't help when you do stuff like he described, sitting naked on a leather armchair and right. holding her in your lap while yeah. she's reading a comic book. Right, and and also the connection with the mom. I think it, it was very important for the uh, mom repressed her definitely for Nab- Nabokov to to describe all these fights and all these arguments that yeah. she had with the mother. So I think. That's what knowing that Humbert her... like worshipped her. Yeah, also, she, you have a mom her. that is keep pushing the girl to get out of the house and leave her alone with Humbert because basically that's what she wanted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you're pushing your kid at 13 to go to a camp with other boys, and what do you you expect to happen that, anyway? So you did that, and now she comes back and she was she thought she was experienced, and she went after Humbert, and of course Humbert didn't have to. You didn't have to twist his arm anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember myself at 12, I, well, I really knew nothing about anything. Um, I was playing Pokemon. Yeah, I was too busy playing Pokemon. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I think in general, kids can be persuaded by very little. I mean, you know, a, a guy in a truck holding candy saying, come with me. You think everything's okay and everything's safe. And you go along with it. Well, she's not an adult that idea never because comes she doesn't know her. anything right. and she hasn't done anything. And that's what he's into, that she's on right on the edge there. Also, yeah. she didn't have the, how you call it, the street? Um, street smarts? Yeah. <laughs> to understand that, okay, hold on a second. This is something wrong here. Yeah. You know, no one told her, hey, someone, if someone puts you in his arms and in his lap, you know, run, basically. So... I heard something the other day that I thought was interesting about kids that um, it was like people have this assumption that kids are usually happy because they don't have as much responsibilities, but studies show that kids are usually, you know, mostly terrified and filled with anxiety. And the reason is they're constantly in these situations where adults either treat them 100% like a kid or 100% like an adult, and their brain doesn't know how to make sense of that. And that reminded me so much of this book, because it'll just switch from Humbert trying to be in father mode, where he's buying her sweet meats, which is candy, it's his weird freakish word for candy, (laughs) or taking her to the movies, or like bouncing her on his lap, or the other mode. And... In, in that sense, I don't think that Lolita had a chance to be a conscious participant in this relationship in the way that Humbert had maybe hoped for. So I think we can scratch that off and say that, no, the love from her was not real, and it could yeah. never have been. I agree with that, yeah. And that brings me to the next thing. Would Humbert have still been into her if she had been everything he hoped for from the beginning like completely submissive just basically a sex slave but also that learned latin and french and became sophisticated like him or would would that have bored him or does is something about the suffering and the pain mixed with the pleasure what he's really into i don't think that has to do uh with anything no no i think i think even after that excerpt we read no the the thing is you can see from the beginning the connection and and how he felt from the first moment he laid eyes on her. But that was just eroticism, because okay. he knew nothing about her. Other but it didn't than how change she later on. It didn't become stronger or less. He went full force from the beginning all the way to the end. I I kind of agree with you. I mean, I think Humbert liked the idea of being with Lolita because it was so 
wrong. And I think that's what made him, like, kept him alive and kept He's him. He's wrong by, by going with any other kid. Look, no, he, I know. Here, here's but one more thing that's, if we want to talk about what's relatable in this book. The fact that Lolita everyone, was pushing back on him, I think he liked. Yeah, and everyone has met one of those couples where they fight all the time, they're at each other's necks, they always complain about the other person, how much they hate them, and they love it. Like, they just love the misery. <laughs> you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, there, there, there are a lot there of couples, couples like that. Couples that love. Yeah. yeah. It's this weird mixture, which is very normal, I think. They can't live together, they can't live apart. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there was something, at least a little bit of that going on. Yeah. I mean, I, there was this quote uh, in the New York Times that I actually wanted to read, and it was a review of Lolita. Um, and it kind of goes back to us talking about Humbert and how not we understood him, but that there is something about Humbert and his relationship that can be relatable. Um, so this was uh, from a review in the New York Times when this came out in 1955. I'm sorry, I don't have who wrote this. To underline the essential, inefficient, painstaking, and pain-giving selfishness of all passion, all greed, of all urges, whatever they may be, that insist on being satisfied without regard to the effect of their satisfaction has upon the outside world, Humbert is in all of us. I'm glad somebody said it. <laughs> Someone said it, and this was in the 50s. But, yeah, I mean... Well, cool literary review people are allowed to get away with more weird stuff than we are now today. Like I think on even on the back of this book, there's a Vanity Fair review that says the only tr believable love the story. The only convincing love story of our century by Vanity Fair. Yeah, yeah what are you doing today? Do, what does that yeah, mean, Vanity Fair? Yeah. Does Not that mean today. Vanity Fair is full of pedophiles? Cancel them. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Canceled. But no, that's what we're saying too. As long as there's no consequences. Well, if you haven't read Lolita, you got to read it. It is controversial. If we don't, if we didn't ruin it for them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you haven't read it, what are you doing? If you want to go back and read it again, it is a beautiful novel. It's really just so sensual and draws you in, and it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever read. Um, I give it a ten out of ten. It <laughs> if I had to review it, definitely it. deserves. Um, to be picked up and, and read through it. Now, again, it's not, uh, I, I've seen many reviews online and everybody said, not everybody, but most of them said that, you know, I, I, I left it uh, because I couldn't finish it because it was disgusting. It was, and I totally agree. I, I get it. If you feel that way and it makes you uncomfortable, don't You gotta push it. through. But if you do push through, <laughs> that's when um, you actually appreciate the writing and you appreciate uh, Nabokov in general and, and his art and what he was able to pull off with this book. If you do get to the end, what what does it all add up to in you guys' opinion? That you Not can, just the, okay, there's a pedophile and they're you know running around in Putting America aside and, the pedophilia, I think this book was about manipulation, about... Uh, how girls can, you know, not realize that they're being manipulated. But at the end of the day, that if you love somebody, you can't go this far with your obsession over them because it can just be dangerous. It can turn into being a pedophile. So it was a warning. <laughs> I take it as a warning, but that's I how I took it. I think it was uh, about as realistic as it could be a love story. Like, this is it. This is the feelings yeah. that you get from a love story. So between was, between a, a person and another person, like this to this connection that a person can have with another person. That's what it is. But not a like a rom com kind no. of love story. No, 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 no. 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 It wasn't not. it wasn't beautiful, it wasn't it was beautiful. It wasn't it wasn't um it wasn't happy. It wasn't very happy. It wasn't enjoyable. For any of those two people, but but when is love happy? Not too often. What is love? <laughs> Baby, Baby, don't hurt, don't hurt me. me. <laughs> I think, uh, strangely, 
Encyclopedia Britannica summed it up pretty good in something I read from them. It said, this book was love examined in the light of its seeming opposite. And I think as a project, that's what it was and what it did pretty successfully. But as far as like um, a fruity little takeaway for the end of the book, it reminded me of something from the end of that show Oz, which Rafi and I just finished. In the last uh, monologue, there's a prisoner saying something like, um, love debases us and elevates us at the same time, which made me think so much of Humbert. And it also made me think nobody really wants to love something that they can control. If something is easy yeah. and not responding, not alive, not yeah. changing, yeah. not challenging you, that's you're not really going to be interested you almost want that as a human which is scary well thank you for listening and watching please make sure you like and subscribe to us and remember if a book is banned it's worth reading <laughs>